viewers who come to regularly view my channel uh, will know that I have a, a specific liking for anything which is space age uh, design. And this Grundig uh, Sonoclock 650SM ticks all the boxes for me. Late 70s, early 80s space age design. Not only the shape really of it, but also the electronics. The clock itself built around a Fairchild FCM 7010 clock chip. All right, and that chip is really special in the sense that it is a very large chip. Um, it has 40 pins, in fact, so it's it's very wide, and um, it also allows for direct drive uh, display. You know, meaning that uh, every single LED which builds up the the or which forms the display is separately uh, driven by the by the chip. Which you could argue um, uh, makes the chip uh, overly large and probably makes it consume more power than technically needed, but it also makes for a very uh, um, nice display which is very easy to look at. Uh, you see, the more recent clock chips all use uh, what we call multiplexing, which means that it, it switches on uh, every single display in turn. You know, very quickly, of course. You can't actually see it with your naked eye that it switches between the digits. But if you would slow it down, you would see it flicker because of the multiplexing. Now, the Fairchild FCM10 uh, doesn't do that. It, it actually continuously drives each and single display element. The radio itself uses the SAS580 and the SAS590 uh, to um, have touch-driven selectors for the, the radio uh, stations. You, see, you only need to touch a specific contact yeah, or switch you could say uh, to uh, select a specific radio station. Um, and uh, those chips were designed mainly to be used in TVs uh, but the engineers and Grundig thought it would be uh, nice to use perhaps on a clock radio. Now this is a, a, a clock radio with FM only and then FM mono at that. Uh, but like I said, uh, the uh, FM uh, stations are selected by touch controls and, and not by mechanical uh, press controls which makes it very futuristic and, and very nice to have. Now, you would argue, okay, but how do you select the radio stations? Well, behind this little panel here, you have a number of uh, multi-turn potentiometers. I don't know if you can see them, but yeah, now you can. So there are a number of multi-turn potentiometers here. And this little nifty tool which is included yeah, allows you to insert it in the potentiometer of the, the selected knob, say knob 5 here. Then you would go to potentiometer 5 and then you would turn the potentiometer the multi-turn potentiometer until you find the radio station you would like to have at position 5. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, it's it's actually quite nifty um, the way it is designed, and uh, also um, it has a switch which allows you to have the alarm clock start uh, on the radio station which is below switch one okay or the last selected radio station so if you put it in the right position then whichever last selected radio station uh, will be used to uh, play music the next time the alarm goes off so very cool um, another cool little design is the sensor here yeah. uh, there is a little sensor here which detects the amount of ambient light to uh, diminish the brightness of the display which is really nice and you can set the uh, minimum brightness with a little potentiometer right here okay. uh, so you have a standard clock you also have the choice between date and clock yeah and then you can set a uh, alarm time and you can also choose between radio on uh, so uh, that would be like this okay radio on uh, radio off uh, alarm automatic so alarm in this position and then it says automatic alarm now I never quite understood what they meant by automatic alarm uh, and I haven't found out yet exactly what it means uh, but I suppose I will I will find out sooner or later oh yeah and before I forgot to mention uh, uh, there is a, a slumber uh, knob on top the clock radio and uh, at the back at the back you uh, do have a an earphone connector which I can't imagine anybody using ever but okay you, you do have an earphone jack here and a uh, three millimeter earphone jack and then you have separate uh, FM uh, uh, antenna connectors so either for a dipole and antenna or a single wire or a single uh, rod antenna yeah. uh, whichever I suppose gives the best reception where you are the Grundig 650 clock radio and now how I restored it enjoy well there's definitely something wrong with the with one of the digits you see so one of the digits uh, LEDs is not lighting up so I'm trying to set the hour all right but well as you can tell um, it doesn't work so this this should be I'm thinking 10 o'clock 11 and then I guess midnight maybe or maybe I don't know uh, 21 hours 23, 24, no, no, could be days too, um, I don't know for, for the moment uh, what this is setting exactly, but what I do know is that one of the LEDs is not lighting up, so there is obviously something wrong there uh, with the display, 
So, um, anyway, uh, what I propose to do now is to uh, switch it off and open it up and have a look at the inside. Alright, so um, I can only see a single screw uh, hidden uh, in there. I don't know if you, you can see it, but it's really, really, it's buried really down there. Okay, it's a Phillips screw buried down there, so let's see if I can... If we can open up the case. Something is moving. Okay, here we go. All right. Okay. Well, now. Whoops. Something fell out of there. Okay, so this is the inside of the case. All right. Quite dirty, by the way. A lot of accumulation of dirt and, and, and grime from over the years. Um, now let's see what's this part here. Uh, it's like a, a, a little plastic red button of some sort which dropped somewhere out of here. I don't know I don't know what this is, is for. So what do we see here? Um, obviously this part here is the display module right here. And it's connected to let's say the motherboard which is down here, the main board, via a single uh, flat wire connector here and this little connector here is for the battery backup <coughs> the battery the backup battery housing being right here okay um, I can see quite a few of electrolytics on the main board right here and here is the the transformer for the power supply and it feels actually quite hot. So, um, it feels quite hot. So yeah, the whole the whole thing must be drawing quite a bit of current. Um, and uh, I do not doubt that one of the electrolytics is um, starting to short. So, uh, it's probably not a bad idea to replace them. Anyway, so this is the, the display board and uh, right underneath it is the FCM7010 uh, clock chip right here. have closer look at that. Then we have uh, what they call the memory board, but which is actually nothing more than uh, a bunch of multi-turn potentiometers. Alright, uh, a few clips held in the display module. You see right here. And fortunately for me, the engineers at Gundig uh, used, made ample use of connectors, which means I can easily disconnect the display and clock module board. Um, and it's held into the front of the case with a few plastic clips. So you need to be a little bit careful. 
uh, when you lift those clips up to release this uh, because uh, those have a, a tendency of breaking uh, quite easily uh, but as you can see it's, it's quite cruddy but if you think this is cruddy hang on so uh, this is the the little quote unquote memory board which is located under the clock module and that was um, uh, paired up to the front of the uh, clock radio with two little screws okay so one on each side um, and that was quite easily to remove as well uh, just pulling one connector and two screws and then we have the main board uh, I have to say this thing really doesn't smell very good uh, on the inside and uh, this is what what's inside yeah and and you can see there's there's quite a bit of uh, dust and dirt accumulation over the years going on here uh, I suspect some of it uh, will be in the usual nicotine layer but there's also a ton of dust bunnies like you can see right here okay uh, this thing has obviously never been opened up before all right I vacuumed as well as I could uh, all the parts of the clock radio uh, inside and out um, and uh, boy oh boy did a lot of dirt come off just by vacuuming um, it's not clean quote unquote by any means uh, but it's certainly a lot more cleaner and it allows us for a better view of the electronics uh, that you see right now on the main board and on the smaller boards as well <clears throat> like uh, the display module over there yeah. so the components on the display module are certainly more legible and, and more visible so uh, what is left for me to do is to give the cabinet uh, the, the parts of the cabinet so the, the back side and the front of the cabinet um, okay uh, and and of course the bottom of the cabinet uh, I have to give it all a good cleaning now uh, which means basically uh, scrubbing with a lot of hot water and soap and uh, the only thing I need to do is to cover up uh, stuff you know like uh, these little stickers here for example uh, with some waterproof tape uh, so that they are not damaged while I'm cleaning the cabinet most parts of the cabinet of the Grundig are heavily scratched and um, yeah, they, they even have yeah, a, a little bit of a, a dimple here and there you know where it got uh, dinged or maybe you know it was dropped maybe or dragged over some surface and uh, I'm afraid that if I'm if I'm going to um, let's say use some emery paper or, or sandpaper to sand most of these dimples out um, I'm going to make it worse uh, because let's not forget uh, this is extruded plastic 
so um, the least bit you take off of the plastic um, well it will show yeah um, and in my opinion it will make the the surface damage even worse so instead of doing that uh, I'm going to do the next best thing which is to give uh, all the parts where needed a final clean with some heavy industrial degreaser uh, and then clean uh, the surfaces off one final time and then uh, give them a coating of uh, plastic primer okay so something like this all right and on top of that uh, once the primer is dry um, I will give um, the, the the surface uh, of the uh, Grundig's cabinet uh, the same kind of, of champagne metallic uh, paint you know a fresh coat of, of champagne colored metallic paint Mind you, this is only the first layer. Um, in about, oh, I'd say half an hour or so, we're going to put down the second layer. Alright, so the weather outside right now um, isn't cooperating with me. Um, and as I do all my painting jobs and such, uh, outside obviously uh, because it's, it's very unhealthy stuff to do indoors uh, but 
it is cold and it's wet and raining and it's it's really not cooperating with me the weather and also I felt like you know changing my routine a little bit and therefore I decided to recap the the boards that need recapping which is the main board and uh, just a, a couple of capacitors on on the, the display board you know there's one here and then there's one over there down there okay so uh, what I'm going to do right now is use my desoldering gun uh, I don't know if you guys are curious to know which desoldering I'm using but this is the one a ZD 915 um, it's a it's a Chinese desoldering gun, uh, but uh, right now it's it's a low budget one as well. Okay, uh, but I'm I'm rather pleased by it. Uh, it, it works well. Um, it's easy to maintain. So uh, taking out the uh, solder filter, air filter, is easy to do. Um, and um, and yeah, you can set the temperature to any temperature you like between say 100 degrees Celsius to I think it's the maximum is 450. But I, I rarely use the highest setting uh, because um, yeah, if you use high settings, you might burn. Uh, or damage the PCB from which you try to uh, desolder parts. I needed to replace a 470 microfarad uh, 63 volts capacitor, <clears throat> but um, I didn't have that, so I had to make my own, and uh, I did it by placing two 1000 microfarad capacitors in series so the anode of one capacitor to the cathode of the other capacitor and by doing this so by putting two 1000 microfarads in series and these are rated uh, uh, to 50 volts individually by putting them in series I made a, a 470 microfarad uh, 100 volts capacitor yeah and uh, to show you the value it has right now let me show you on my little tester all right so this is my little components tester so here we go. So there you go. I, I effectively created a capacitor of 457 microfarad, uh, 100 volts. Okay, and it's not lossy, and it's it has a relatively low ESR, so which is good. So we're off by about 13 microfarads, but I don't think that will matter very much. Uh, remember, I was looking for the smoking gun uh, for, uh, you know, a possible problem with voltages not being right in the power supply area because of a shorted capacitor. And uh, this is what I found when I unsoldered it <coughs> I don't know if you can see this but this capacitor actually blew up you know you can see it it's its bottom blew out you know and it, it leaked I mean like physically leaked yeah. So when I, I measured this one, which should be a 
220, 220 microfarad 35 volts uh, I get a nonsensical value let me show you yeah. uh, here you go oh well <laughs> yeah uh, now the, the, the tester doesn't even recognize it you see it's 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 broken yeah so there's your problem all right I connected up the uh, clock radio to the power outlet over there let me show you so over there in the corner right there and that power outlet that orange power outlet is connected in turn to my variac over there all right and um, uh, that is uh, the variac is is fuse protected so and and what you see beneath there uh, with the display over there is a, a isolation transformer okay so we're not connected directly to the AC okay so um, anyway what we will try to do now is um, to switch the clock radio on yeah and then see if the display, at least the display, uh, reacts normally. If it does, then we can perhaps even try to, to test out the radio. So, this is for me a first, just as it is for you. So, here we go. Let's see if I can reach the switch. And I, I hope it won't explode in my face, but there we go. Okay. Huh. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I don't know what I mean. I think that is, uh, that is the basic um, circuitry okay well it is counting clock pulses I don't know how to set the clock uh, yet, but I would say it all looks rather normal. Um, yeah, it all looks rather normal. Um, The display seems to be working, at least for now, uh, for this test. But um, okay, so <laughs> what I'll try to figure out right uh, next is how to to set the clock. Uh, I've been postponing it uh, because I wanted to work on the electronics first. Uh, but yeah, I think the moment has come for me to figure out how to actually set the clock. Well, just as I predicted, um, replacing the uh, capacitors uh, did the trick. So I was kind of uh, doubtful at first that it might help, but 
in the end, uh, replacing two shorted capacitors did help. And the display, as you can tell, now works perfectly. And oh yes, I finally found out how to set the date and the time. Um, actually, uh, setting the date is done by uh, uh, pushing this knob right here down uh, wait you can't see this uh, okay so you can set the date by pushing this knob down and keeping it down and then using the first two knobs here the first two knobs from the left to set the day and the month uh, remember this is a European clock so uh, in Europe we we uh, show the day first and on the month afterwards, not like in the United States, okay? Um, and once the date is set, which uh, today is the 19th of uh, September, um, you can actually set the time. And by setting, uh, setting the time is quite easy, is you release the right switch here. And, and until it stands more or less in the middle yeah and then uh, by again pressing the two knobs of, uh, from the left so the, you can set the uh, hours and the minutes okay and when you pull this the right knob up you can set the alarm time so when you want to be woken up by the alarm clock and that's it really uh, there's not much more to it there's a, a, a strange little quirk uh, with the clock ship uh, chip though uh, that is that if you set the minutes um, initially it jumps the first 10 minutes uh, and then it it uh, in increments the minutes uh, by the unit you know so 11 12 13 etc um, and it's only after you've done a complete cycle till 59 and then you return to zero then you can set the first 10 minutes as well so from zero well basically from one to nine uh, don't ask me why but apparently that's what the clock chip seems to uh, want. All right, uh, I connected up the speaker, uh, so now we can uh, we give, we can give it a go, I think. Uh, but I can't remind you, I can't play the radio for very long. Uh, because of uh, possible copy strikes, right? Let's see. So there you go, the, the radio does work. Um, so, uh, what do we have to do next? Well, what I am going to do is uh, I am going to mount uh, on the AC uh, that comes into the clock radio. I am going to mount a, a fuse. Uh, well, a fuse holder and a fuse, uh, because, well, I, I don't trust 100% uh, 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 vintage stuff, uh, because, you know, 
and back in the day people were a lot more lax about safety and all that um, and they thought you know that the main fuse in the house uh, would take care of it all uh, but I'm not that trusting so yeah uh, I am going to build in a fuse uh, right there at the input to the transformer and uh, that way I'll feel a lot safer I'm going to finish work on the front of the uh, clock radio uh, of the Grundig clock radio uh, I'm going to clean it up as well as I can and then what I'm going to do is uh, tape off the legends that are still there that I can still save let's say uh, and then spray coat the, the whole front with uh, black satin uh, paint so not not glossy but satin look all right I um, <coughs> I cleaned the cover of the IF module here and uh, not that I particularly polished it up but I clean it off with a thousand grit uh, sandpaper just you know to uh, knock off most of the dirt and uh, and oxidation it, it actually looked more like this all right but I'm not going to bother with the inside uh, I just wanted to have a clean uh, surface on top all right so I'm going to put this back on top of the case here of the IF module and once that's done we'll continue on uh, fixing a few other little nicks and knacks all right the next thing I need to do is to uh, fit back the knob onto the potentiometer here and as you can see the um, <coughs> the shaft of the potentiometer has been uh, uh, beveled off okay so it has more a D shape really and uh, the profile inside the knob is just the same D profile so you need to slide them onto each other and by the way uh, just so you know inside the knob <coughs> there's some tiny lettering and uh, that is actually the side you need to point towards the potentiometer uh, the other side is blank there's no writing there of any sort okay so ultimately the knob will ride these little uh, horseshoe shaped um, clamps here now these are plastic okay so they are quite brittle uh, so you need to be really really gentle once you press the knob into them okay so you need to apply just enough pressure so that they uh, temporarily widen those plastic clamps just enough so that they slide so that the button slides into place okay so in my opinion the easiest way to to mount these back is by sliding them first onto the potentiometer like this okay and then positioning the knob right on top of those two horseshoe clamps at either side and then to gently really gently press down on the knob on one side and then on the other side like that there you go all right so I mounted back the knobs uh, on 
the clock radio and uh, now they they roll around freely there's nothing obstructing their their uh, rolling um, by the way the tone control has like a little catch in the center so so that you know you're neither on the high or on the low side of it you're perfectly centered yeah the volume doesn't have a catch at all so it it turns all the way from minimum to maximum all right so i also cleaned the uh, clock backup battery contacts which is basically nothing more than a 9 volt uh, connector uh, it was slightly corroded but uh, I cleaned it off with a wire brush and, and basically that's it it'll do as it is okay um, at the factory apparently they considered making a little knot in the wire sufficient as a sort of a pull relief yeah uh, how do you call that a stress relief okay so you can't pull the cable all the way through which is fine also uh, some of you might have noticed the fuse down there on the circuit and uh, I had a look at it it's still good and uh, it was installed there uh, at the the factory and it's in fact a 63 milliamps fuse um, <coughs> in my opinion 63 milliamps is a bit high uh, I believe uh, it could have easily been a lower one um, I did mount a fuse holder on the AC you see it here okay under my pinky here uh, and and uh, I put in basically a 35 milliamps fuse in there which is more than enough okay so uh, in my opinion you don't you don't actually need uh, more than 35 milliamps at least on the AC side um, the the DC fuse is basically on the mains B plus or the mains DC output of the power supply so there you go uh, I also mounted back the, the little cover of the IF module um, what I need to do uh, next is um, inspect everything a final time before I uh, start uh, reassembling the whole uh, clock radio um, what I do need to do now is to um, reattach the um, the transformer okay so the transformer really clamps into place in these plastic holders there's there's one like this on the other side of the transformer and it really it, it clamps together like this okay with two very long screws and a little metal bracket you you probably just about see right here okay now when I released this there was quite a bit of red plastic crud that let go and I have no idea what this why this is necessary but you know the little pieces of plastic like this okay so it, it's about I would say a mill thick and that was sandwiched between the metal clamp and the plastic holder um, I really have no idea what the function of this is I mean maybe it's a sort of a shin or something um, I'm going to see if I can emulate this with some other material less brittle anyway and uh, and then mount the transformer back 
uh, in its original uh, position. Yeah, uh, if any of you know why they shinned it with this, uh, please let me know, because to me it's an absolute mystery why this would be necessary at all. Alright, next are the little rubber feet which I detached uh, from uh, the bottom of the cabinet. Alright, so from the four corners of the cabinet. And uh, these are, are pretty easy to remove. You just pull them loose and then you press fit them back and that's it. Normally there would be little felt covers uh, around the stem of the switches left and right. And But unfortunately these felt covers they they were so old and used up they fell apart. So what I actually did was to cut um, little pieces of captain tape which uh, which I then folded double with the sticky sides towards each other and then I cut a little hole in the middle and uh, that seems to work perfectly well you know uh, as you can tell the, 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 the tape follows the switch stem perfectly okay they the function really of those felt covers was to close up that gap around the stem so that no fods you know foreign object debris could enter the switches you know same thing over there you see so these little covers prevent from foreign objects and dirt to enter those switches. So that's perfect. Um, and I did the same thing with that mysterious little switch here on the band, well, the channel selector. I still need to find out exactly what this switch does. Now, we have a final problem to solve and that is the snooze switch. So on top of the clock module there is a, a little switch the remnants of which you see here. Okay, And luckily enough for me when I disassembled the clock radio I actually found the missing part of the switch which is this little thing here. Okay. So apparently it's a slider and it has metal contacts on either side. You know, and the slider would sit in there and go up like this. And when you push on the snooze button, the slider contacts would make contact on either side of the switch. You know when the button would be pressed down okay now the reason why it fell out I believe would have been somebody who uh, pressed too hard on the snooze button on top here and which made that little red plunger uh, break through the bottom of the switch and uh, it probably dropped out and then in the end ended up at the bottom of the clock radio. So I need to find a solution to repair that switch. Now lucky me, when I uh, disassembled the clock radio, I found the original button plunger uh, inside, which is this little thing here. Now, with the plunger, must have come a little spring, okay, which fits right over this guiding pin right here. Now, in my hoard of old springs, I found this one, 
and that seems like a perfect match for the plunger. Let me show you. There you go. See? The, the spring is a perfect match. So, what I intend to do is to reinsert the plunger inside the uh, button housing and then close it up with a little plastic strip I cut, which you see here. It's semi-pliable plastic and uh, I intend to use it as, you could say, the butt end of the, the, the knobs uh, housing. Um, and lucky me, the PCB had a little slot cut into it, probably for the original uh, end cap of the button housing. Yeah. So um, I made grateful use of that and uh, and I cut this little plastic strip here uh, and so uh, what I need to do now is reinsert the plunger into the button and then see if the whole thing will work I don't know whether you can see this but the contacts on the plunger are extremely small okay so I'm going to grab the plunger with my fingers so I think that gives you an idea of how small those contacts really are okay so in my first attempt to reintroduce the plunger into the uh, button housing um, it didn't work out. Um, it snagged while I was trying to insert it and one of the little copper contacts you see um, let, let go of the plastic plunger's body yeah of the well of that red little thing and uh, fortunately for me I found uh, the contact uh, again so I found them back the contacts and I mounted them back and I this time I glued them with some super glue to the body of the plunger uh, because I, I didn't want to run the risk of losing them uh, again so I glued both of them uh, in the center with tiny tiny drops of uh, super glue now um, in order to avoid the same problem while I try to reinsert the plunger uh, in the housing there um, I'm going to use uh, s small pieces of uh, thick paper as uh, guides into the button housing and uh, that way uh, the little contacts shouldn't uh, snag while I try to push them in uh, and once the plunger is in the housing uh, the only thing I need to do is to pull out these little paper strips and uh, yeah, and that way uh, the plunger will be reinserted without any problems, I hope. And when that is done, I just uh, place the replacement spring I found uh, on the guiding pin of the plunger. And then I reinsert the little uh, back plate I cut out for the buttons housing okay it took me three attempts to get it right uh, but the third attempt seems to be the right one and there is the result okay so uh, 
and you can see the little hole at the bottom for the plunger's guiding pin to slide through. Okay, you see? Okay, uh, this is the other side. So yeah, what caused me most trouble uh, while making the part is to get the, the hole for the plunger's guiding pin to be just the right size and centered precisely below it. Um, and that's what caused, caused me most trouble. Um, if the hole obviously is too small, the, the guiding pin won't be able to slide through it. If, on the other hand, the hole is too large, um, the spring holding up uh, the plunger will just slide through the hole and, uh, yeah, will, uh, will not uh, perform its function anymore, namely of, of holding up the plunger in the up position like it is right now. All right, I had a closer look at the lens, the main lens, and um, uh, basically it, it doesn't really matter uh, whether the large notch on top here uh, is pointing up or down. Um, aside from this large not, uh, notch here, uh, the the lens is basically symmetrical in both directions. Um, so yeah, it doesn't really matter uh, how I orientated uh, inside the clock module. So um, uh, up it will be the large notch. So what I'm going to do now is wipe it off a final time on the inside with a rag to make sure there's no dirt uh, left uh, on the inside and then uh, I'm going to slide it back in and fix it. Well, there you go. Uh, the main lens is uh, in place as well uh, as is the lens for the light sensor. Uh, we've repaired the snooze button mechanism up here. So I think uh, the moment has come to uh, place back uh, all the parts of the clock radio. Next we need to place the clock module back into the front panel. Now uh, you'll notice these large rectangular slots uh, on top of the clock module, right? Uh, so this one and that one. Now 
in the housing or in the cabinet there are four tabs so there's one here one here and then two more down here okay these four tabs um, fit right into these square slots all right so on the underside of the clock module there are those same slots you notice that at the top so um, the clock module is in fact uh, held to the front of the cabinet uh, via press fit uh, into plastic tabs uh, two at the top and two at the bottom but I need unfortunately both my hands to do it um, and uh, the setup as it is is a bit hard for me to well it's, it's hard for me to do it like I'm filming right now I mean the camera is <clears throat> is basically standing between my legs uh, while I'm filming this and um, it's really not very practical so um, you know what I'll do uh, and I'm going to do it right now and when I'm done uh, I'll bring you uh, back and show you the result I I couldn't resist um, pulling off the masking tape uh, of the legend of the well above the buttons you know the button legend and uh, well so I pulled off the masking tape and and it looks okay I mean it, it doesn't look exactly the same as the rest of the front uh, but you know um, I don't have any lettering to replace the original uh, lettering and um, <clears throat> otherwise I would have painted it over and then placed new lettering but but yeah I, I don't have any um, maybe some of you might know uh, where I might get some but uh, for the moment uh, it will have to do like this I can I can always you know unmount the front panel and then uh, repaint it and then place new lettering on top uh, the day I, I do find the uh, fitting lettering so far it looks okay.
that would be quite hard to achieve but compared to how it looked like when I received it uh, this looks uh, I'm sure you'll agree a lot better so um, what is left for me to do is um, to um, maybe run through the channels uh, that I programmed on the radio at least I think I, I programmed them all uh, but uh, yeah I, I think uh, it is expected uh, at least of a radio to go through at least once through all the channels so uh, let's just do that okay uh, let's see it's on okay so I won't be able to linger for too long on any particular uh, station okay but um, here it goes he died since October 1982 it is a important moment for the Nele Scheerling from Uitbater NG Nu zal stopzetting de operator in de controlezaal moeten dan altijd heel nauw gezet de procedures volgen. Dus dat was echt in, in beperkte kring om het sereen te houden, zodat die mensen zich ook konden concentreren op hun werk. Maar we twijfelen er niet aan dat het wel, ja, dat het toch een emotioneel moment was voor hen. Werknemers die 45 jaar of ouder zijn krijgen werkzekerheid tot aan het pensioen, ook omdat er nog veel werk is voor de ontmanteling en de uitbating van de andere centrales. Voetbal, twee tegenstanders van de Rode Duivels straks op het WK in Qatar hebben een oefenwedstrijd gespeeld. Marokko versloeg Chili met 2-0 en ook Canada kon winnen met 2-0 van het organiserend land Qatar. Kroatië, de derde tegenstander, speelt zondag. De eerste wedstrijd van de Rode Duivels op het WK is op 23 november. Het weer vannacht betrokken met soms vrij veel regen over het westen, lichte regen in het oosten bij temperaturen tot 14 graden. Ook overdag krijgen we veel regen, de meeste neerslag valt in het westen en het wordt niet warmer dan 18 graden. Meer op 14 nieuws.be. loud and uh, the quality the sound quality is not too bad uh, for a mono FM receiver so all in all I'm I'm pretty happy with uh, the result of the restoration and I, I hope you all enjoyed watching this uh, video uh, leave any comments below the video if you want uh, and uh, I'll see you all for another video soon. So, thanks for watching. <laughs>